Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the previous session we looked at thermal performance of building envelopes that was a session 1 <coughs> where we started with different modes of heat transfer the principles and basics we looked at and some of the building application examples that I was showing you. In this particular module we will look at the indices and measures that we primarily use to assess thermal performance of building envelope. We will look at specific types of insulation and how to assess its performance. We will primarily focus on the Indian standards and codes and how we assess it using our national building code. I will also show you some applied examples. So, to get a quick recap, we looked at three types of insulation. First was the resistive insulation, the common index which we use is the U value or thermal transmittance, then or the R value of course. Then we have a second type of insulation which is a reflective insulation and the third type which is capacitive insulation which goes on with the thermal capacity of a particular building envelope. So, we looked at this picture, we, we are talking about the intensities and the pattern of heat gains and losses through a particular wall. So, this is a wall cross section again, this wall has a high thermal transmittance or highly conducting wall, this is a low thermal transmittance or probably an insulation you know insulated wall more closely an insulated wall. So, here we looked at at what rate the heat gain happens during the daytime. this is a 48 hour that is 2 day cycle where the heat gain happens and then how it is transmitted indoor and then how it is reabsorbed and retransmitted outside. So, few important things that we need to further note in order to evaluate the thermal performance this is again the conductive heat flow I showed you two other images you know which correspond to convective as well as radiative heat flow. In this particular thing where two things are important, one is the magnitude where the bars indicate the magnitude. The next important thing is the time which takes for the wall to conduct it inside. So, between the ambient peak or the peak heat gain versus the indoor peak or to what extent the heat gain happens indoor this considerably varies from one wall section to the other wall section. It varies based on the orientation, it varies based on the material properties, it varies based on the ambient as well as indoor conditions. So, we will look little more in detail about these things in the current module. So, how do we assess the effectiveness of thermal performance? So, you know as a designer we need to choose materials, we need to choose wall systems and we have to also ensure these materials or these systems or components are performing well. So, the common way people use are certain indicators or numbers. So, you are going to buy a product, you are going to buy a material, thermal insulation material or a wall system or a window component. You know the company would be showing you a booklet, a technical data sheet which has lot of numbers. How do we understand which number is essential, which is less essential, which we have to look at and which is more representative or indicative. So, we will we'll get little more understanding, develop little more understanding on this side. So, the thermal efficiency of a building envelope can be looked at in three levels. The first is the element level, second is a component level and third is an assembly level. So, when I say you know element level it means the it starts from basically the microstructure, it is like a inherent property of the material. At the component level say for example, what is a performance or thermal efficiency of a brick? or a brick wall or a particular block, you know aerated concrete block or an insulated system. Then the third level is the assembly level. So, when I have a whole system, when I have the whole wall, then the thermal efficiency can be looked at. What are the merits and demerits? We will look more closely at today. Apart from this, there are two other things. There is the high growth thermal efficiency of overall building enclosure. When I say high growth thermal, it is thermal as well as moisture. So, more or less both are you know both of these things are very closely related to each other. When I say moisture, what happens when the you know wall system or a particular material gets wet? The you know pores within the material absorbs water, they get little more dense than their regular. Say you know a material soaked in water is slightly higher in density than a dry material. Then 
the you know type of heat transfer happening through that particular medium considerably varies. Apart from this, though we do not look more in detail about the moisture related things or problems in you know most part of the India, it is of specific importance in places where it is more moist as well as colder climates. For example, you know much of the countries in close to the pole, polar region, say a lot of European countries, Canada and northern parts of US, moisture is a major problem. They look at moisture movement, high grow, you know, high Greek movement across the wall sections more critically. It is as critical as the thermal itself for two reasons. One is the type of material they use by itself. There is a lot of wooden construction, lightweight construction happening. And number two, there is snow outside. It freezes out. So, the internal surface, you know, the internal areas, the spaces are heated. So, the kind of moisture transfer is very crucial there. Another important thing is air tightness of building enclosure. This applies to a tightly sealed and conditioned buildings. A lot of people have presented, you know, if you search online, surf online, you will find images on thermal imaging. If you take a close look at it, there is a lot of, you know, heat loss which happens through the you know improperly sealed windows or wall junctions when the joints and seals are not proper there is a lot of air movement seepage outside on the other hand it is infiltration heat gain inside which considerably increases both the heating and cooling load as far this module is concerned we will primarily focus on the thermal efficiency at three levels first when i said element level or component and next the component level this is a cross section of a frame we did a thermal analysis of the frame how heat moves through a frame. This is a you know transform or mully and it can be anything. In this case, this is a transform where this is a glass, this is a total frame surface outside versus inside. The mode of heat transfer from one end to the other end, it gets heated up and eventually the heat builds up and then it moves on to the other. This can be a wall surface where you can assess one dimensional, two dimensional or three dimensional heat transfer. Primarily, we will talk about one and two dimensional heat transfer in terms of elemental performance. How one surface is heated up and eventually it passes on the heat or it flows to the other side in course of time. Most of the element level performance deal with the static level factors. Next is the component level performance. What happens when you have a glazing assembly? The next thing is when you have two glasses put together or the whole thickness, say there is a glass layer, there is a air layer and then there is a next level of glass. So, what happens with this performance? We will look at as a component. So, element level properties primarily give an idea about the thermal resistance to the heat flowing from one side to the other. Simple example, common example is a thermal conductivity. It is a material level property it gives you the indicative idea about whether the material is resistive to the heat flow or not. Next is the component level property. It gives you slightly more, you know, much better idea about or more precise idea about the thermal performance of the component. Say an example can be thermal transmittance. When I say thermal transmittance or thermal conductance, resistance, we talk about material in its thickness say thermal transmittance of a 230 mm brick wall, thermal transmittance of a 200 mm thick solid concrete wall. So, these kind of things will give you a slightly better idea than the element level performance about the heat flow. The next level is the assembly level properties or say for example, you have a window frame and wall assembly. What happens to the overall performance of this wall system? In this set, this is more critical and this gives you a very clear picture about three types of heat transfer. It gives you an idea about the resistive properties of the whole system. It gives you reflective properties of the whole assembly and then it gives you the capacitive or the heat storing capacity of the whole assembly. Examples can be the whole wall thermal transmittance. I am introducing two new terms, time lag and decrement factor. We will look at these two terms more in detail, but to have a clear understanding, we should get much closer to the assembly level properties. But to take a practical note of what we actually get, primarily we get inputs regarding the component level properties as well as element level properties. Element level properties are more easy to test. They are static tests done in laboratories. People 
conduct you know thermal conductivity test hot plate apparatus that i was talking about you have a hot and cold sheet you pass on heat and find out how insulative or resistive the material is this tests are commonly done you buy any material thermal conductivity values are spontaneously given the next property which is more commonly available in field is a component level property where people can estimate it or compute it as well it involves two three or three you know one two or three dimensional heat transfers some things are measured but most of it is computed for example a particular seller may give you a component level property of an insulated wall system he will say my wall system has 100 mm thick block work plus 50 mm thick insulation or 100 mm thick insulation the overall component level u value or thermal transmittance is such and such so this particular property might have been measured or he would have measured individual properties and computed it so component level properties are also increasingly available at least for most of the products used in the building envelope but what is less available is the whole assembly level property which is more or less computed and the moment you start computing them there is a lot of uncertainty which happens in these values we will look at why they are happening and what actually the differences are before that national building code of india nbc prescribes some of these things in detail it has recommendations for u value that is thermal transmittance it tells you <coughs> which climate zone you are with respect to that what is a recommended u value what is a maximum u value you can go for your wall or any system that you use should have values less than what nbc is prescribing the next important thing it talks about is something called thermal damping we'll define and look at some examples more closely thermal damping depends on outdoor as well as indoor temperatures the next property is thermal performance index tpi it is based on ts or the surface temperature inside surface temperature of walls are taken into account when thermal performance index is calculated next is thermal time constant tdc it is also a material property we'll look more in detail about this then the last thing is building index <coughs> it is a overall heat gain through the enclosure which is whichever wall window area fenestration area is exposed you calculate the heat gains and cumulate them call it building index so we will take a look at the capacitive insulation so we looked at resistive insulation and reflective insulation before getting into what these indexes mean first let us take a closer look at what happens with the capacitive insulation as i said we have been traditionally using this type of insulation much commonly most of our old buildings especially palaces bigger you know occupants residential spaces even had adobe walls you are you know thick granite slabs they had a high thermal capacity what is the thermal capacity all about it refers to the material which can store thermal energy and then you know for an extended period of course and then give it back outside release it outside so what happens as a consequence it can absorb a lot of daytime heat it can be due to temperature as well as solar radiation it absorbs and then it releases or re releases it during the night time to the ambient itself rather than passing it on inside it is by virtue of the materials density specific heat capacity as well as the thickness of the whole system as a consequence it reduces the daytime cooling load as well as it reduces the nighttime heating load so here one thing we have to understand imagine this is a case with a hard and dry climate the ambient temperature may go as high as say 45 or 46 degree and the nighttime temperatures drops to 25 degrees one thing we need to understand as a effect of thermal capacity this is outside temperature as i said this is the inside temperature so this much amount of thermal energy is dampened this is absorbed and the inside temperature fluctuates here so you are saved this much amount of cooling energy rather than cooling the air from 45 degrees to 24 degrees effectively you are only cooling it from this particular temperature say it may be around 30 degrees or 32 degrees then <coughs> other side of it what happens when the ambient temperature drops well below the inside is also kept more or less warm so the inside temperature fluctuation is much lesser always we look at time lag the major parameter that we look at based on capacitive insulation is how much time it takes for the maximum to occur compared to the outside maximum so if this is outside maximum this is inside maximum this for example happens at 2 o'clock in the afternoon 
this is the ambient maximum on a particular surface. Re you know remember this is sol air temperature <coughs> which is a cumulative value including air temperature, it includes the absorptivity of the wall surface and it includes the solar radiation. This is a sol air temperature maximum and this is a inside wall surface temperature. So, the outside surface temperature versus the in inside surface temperature say around 1 and a half to 2 hours or as the thermal capacity increases say a thick adobe wall it can go as far as 4 to 5 hours in terms of thermal lag. There are wall systems which are even more you know which have a larger thermal lag also. But the other side of it we should not be missing what happens? The same effect happens in the night time also. It may be advantageous in some cases, it may be disadvantageous in some cases. As I said imagine this is 45 degrees, this is coming down to 35 degrees. Instead of rising up to 45, there is a 10 degree reduction in the daytime maxima. So, this is now 35 degrees. The minimum temperature drops to say 25 degrees. So, the diurnal variation is somewhere around 20 degrees. The inside here drops to say 30 degrees. So, what happens when your comfort or the preferred temperature, we were looking at thermal comfort in the previous sessions, our comfort and preferred temperature somewhere lie between say 26, 29 degrees depends on season, age, gender, etcetera. So, imagine it is somewhere around 26, 28 degrees, daytime you are saved, it is getting as close to 35 degrees, further you can enhance it with air movement or you can have some passive as well as active cooling. So, here you are saving energy and you are being comfortable. But night time, it is also not dissipating the heat, it is still holding this much amount of heat. So, the temperatures are higher. This particular place, traditionally what people did, they were coupling it with night ventilation. So, they used to open the windows, they used to ventilate the houses, so that the ambient temperature, the indoor temperature gets as close as possible to the ambient temperature. So, in this case, the night time performance will not be as cyclic as this, but it will get closer to the ambient temperature. So, primarily when we have to learn about capacitive insulation, the first thing we look at is the time lag and the second important thing is the amplitude reduction. As I said, time lag, this is a ambient variation from minimum to maximum and the indoor, there is a reduction in amplitude as well as the difference in time. This is recorded in terms of time lag and the amplitude reduction. So, we have lot of traditional examples, I have put this Egyptian storage areas, but we do not have to go all the far, you know, to Egypt, we had a lot of indigenous examples starting from, you know, poor man's mud house <coughs> to palatial spaces, where thermal mass or the capacitive insulation has been all the more effectively employed. Some measurements that we took, there are two types of wall systems, we are not getting into what walls they are, but typically the grey line represents a wall system and the red represents another wall system. Recording for two days again like last time, it goes from 0 and 1 day, sorry this is 3 days, this is the first day, second day and third day. We will look at the second day's data more closely. So, what happens? This dark, you know, thick line, this represents the outside surface temperature, it goes as high as 47 degrees and this is the inside surface temperature, climbs up to 43 degrees. And these are test measurements, so we do not have to worry about what intensity actually they are, it may go up or it may be lesser than this. In this case, it went up to 47 degrees, inside is 43, so the difference what we see here is 3 and half degrees. This is like a thin wall system, then again we take a 110 mm thin brick wall system. In this case, sorry this is a 230 mm thick, you know slightly thicker section where the ambient temperature maxima or the outside surface temperature, sol air temperature went up to 49 degrees and the inside amplitude was 41, close to 41 degrees. So, there was more or less an 8 degree reduction in the maximum temperature, this is the peak temperature. Apart from this, what we need to know, on the other side of it, we also notice a similar difference. So, the ambient temperatures, this was night ventilated, so the ambient temperature goes as close to around 35 degrees, 34 and a half degrees precisely, but the indoor temperature also gets closer, it is around 35 and a half, 35 and a half degrees here, but in this case the ambient temperature, surface temperature drops to 34, whereas the inside surface temperature is 36, there is a 2 degree temperature difference. So, there is a reduction in amplitude, if you take the time lag calculation or the reduction in amplitude calculation first, there is a considerable difference between what happens in the daytime and what happens in the night time. 
Another important thing here is the time difference. So, if you look at what is a shift, that is a phase shift, this is a maximum peak temperature occurring at somewhere around 1630 or 17. Then for the inside peak to happen, I am talking about this grey line here, it happens 2 hours after the outside surface peak has occurred. On the other hand here, it is more than 3 hours. Similar thing happens in the night time also. So, what we need to understand? This wall system 1 heats up faster, which is not really good. So, we have to do something. But in the process of doing something, say you want to increase the thickness, you want to change the material insulated. In this process, we should also not forget by doing that, the heat loss or the dissipation also increases. Imagine this is a living room or an office space which is occupied from 9 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock it is closed, air conditioner is running. So, in that case, insulating or increasing the thickness or doing some material change might be beneficial in this case. Whereas, for residential buildings, mainly you know where you would get into the room to sleep say around 9 o'clock you turn on the air conditioner, you go to bed at 10 o'clock. Then if you still have a longer time lag, you know your heat is not getting dissipated much faster. As you you know increase the thickness, insulate it more, this is going to go up. Instead of 2, it becomes 3, it may become 5. In that case, the wall will still be holding lot of heat and getting back to the interiors. In that sense, this is going to consume slightly more energy compared to the other wall system. Here, another important thing that we need to understand, we have to always look at time lag and decrement factor more closely with respect to each other. This is not independent, it is the phase shift as well as the amplitude shift which is important here. It is not just the factor of wall system itself, here it is also a system, you know varying based on the type of insulation where you put the insulation. If you have internal insulation, the time lag and decrement factor considerably varies. If you have an external insulation, it considerably varies. Now, let us for the moment omit the you know grey lines. Again, the grey line is an uninsulated wall system. The one you see here, this line, this is a outside insulation. This is external insulation, outside versus inside temperature. The orange one is internal, internal insulation outside versus inside surface temperature. So, what we see closely here, when the wall has an external insulation, the solid air temperature outside goes really high, but the inside surface temperature is dampened, it is more or less flat. Whereas, in the case of internal insulation, the ambient temperature is you know solid air temperature is slightly lesser, whereas the internal temperature also fluctuates little bit more. This graph and the previous one one crucial thing we should not forget, the effect of ventilation. Your windows and the ventilation efficiency really play a crucial role in determining how effective your insulation or the capacitive insulation precisely functions. In this case, the indoor temperature is more or less dampened and it is flat revolving around 34 and half degrees and 35 degrees. It goes to 35 and half in the third day. So, in this case, if you consider around 35 as an average indoor temperature, even in the night time, the temperatures are going to be much higher. You, are, you will set your air conditioner probably at 22 or 23 degrees. So, you will have to still be cooling it down much more than what you will do for an uninsulated wall system. Sometimes, that would perform much better than the insulated wall system, especially in the night time. So, keeping this in mind, if you ventilate your building properly, if your windows are so oriented and if your ventilation effectiveness is much higher then you can have benefit of this insulation system during daytime and ventilation will play its role, convective cooling will happen during evenings and the night time before you know before turning on the air conditioner. More details about the amplitude reduction and the time reduction. Apart from insulation, another important factor which affects you know this time lag and decrement factor could be your shading, especially the presence or absence of balconies. They not only affect the magnitude say here this is without balcony, this is with balcony, the you know magnitude of solid air temperature, the peak solid air temperature reduces, which affects the indoor surface temperatures. Apart from this, it also impacts your ventilation efficiency. The time lag, you know, and the amplitude reduction is considerable here. Now, I am going to introduce you to an important factor, which is called decrement factor. So, far we have been talking about time lag, straightforward. 
So, you have outside peak and the time associated and the inside peak and the time associated. So, the next thing I was talking about is amplitude reduction. We saw 3 degree reduction, 8 degree reduction, 15 degree reduction in some cases. Now, how do you quantify this number? There is an indicator called decrement factor which is very simple delta T in or the T i maximum this is indoor temperature maximum surface temperature here then indoor surface temperature minimum by delta T o which is a outside surface temperature maximum and surface temperature minimum. So, if you take this ratio you get a number between 0 and 1 which gives you the decrement factor. As far national code or national building code is concerned we refer to a 1 minus factor that is thermal damping which is almost the same it is a reverse of it where you have the delta T o minus delta T i this is outside temperature range minus inside temperature range by the outside temperature range this actually takes into account the varying amplitude this is not surface temperature based but this is the ambient air temperature and the indoor air temperature based. So, what happens here? you take the outside peak say 45 degrees maximum 25 degrees minimum. So, you have a delta T of 20 inside you have a delta T similarly 10 degrees for example, say it is fluctuating somewhere between you know say 40 degrees to 30 degrees. So, you have a delta T of 10 degrees. So, you will get if you substitute you will get a thermal damping of about 50 percentage. So, it is 50 percent damped. So, our national building code prescribe certain damping values for you know which has to be adhered to minimum damping this is. So, your damping has to be higher than what is prescribed in the national code. We will look at the numbers more in you know detail in the following session. I will you know wrap up this session at this point. In the following session we will look you know more in detail about how these indices impact.